Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SEG Women's Network webinar this month of August. Uh, today, we have a great uh, discussion planned for um, everyone with Anglia Sweet, uh, a former colleague of mine, and I'm very happy to have her on with you guys to talk about her career journey and some uh, challenges that she's overcome and uh, different ways that she has leveraged uh, her network and some things that she's learned in uh, along the way. So uh, with uh, we will have some questions um, at the end. Um, so if you have any questions um, that you'd like to ask Anglia, um, please feel free to use that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then we will get to those um, as part of the conversation um, after Anglia's presentation. And uh, we will now go ahead and uh, get started with Anglia. Thank you very much, Roxy, and it's good to see you. And thank you, uh, Roxy and the committee in inviting me to be uh, a guest speaker today. I'm very honored uh, to be invited and share experience with everyone. And I'm happy to see that there are more than three people in the participants. And actually, uh, there are quite a few uh, names that, um, you know, my old colleagues in Norway even attend today. I appreciate that. And uh, many other friends uh, and colleagues in the past. So thank you very much for uh, spending time with me today. So I keep it very casual and I only have about maybe 30 minutes or 40 minutes of material to share. And then we'll have a lively conversation, I hope. So uh, what you're going to see today is basically, um, let me move on to, okay. So um, if you come here to look for a solution, or uh, some kind of ideas about work-life balance, I think you're coming to the wrong place because I don't assume that I, I don't uh, want to convey that I have answer uh, to that. You know, I'm struggle every day, just like the rest of you to uh, balance my family and my life. So that is something I'm still looking forward to. Uh, so what I'm gonna share with you today is basically my career, uh, my current work, uh, where I am, which is I'm presenting from Mexico City, from Petronas office in Mexico City. Um, about my professional experience, my career journey, some of the challenges that I have as a woman, minority, and just a professional person. Um, and, and something that happened in my career uh, after, uh, you know, been working for a long time, and that caused me to have a reset, an assessment about myself and my career, where I want to be. Um, and then I just want to emphasize at the end about the uh, career growth to networking, how important it is for everyone, right? So let's start with where I am now, just to give you, this is all what I'm going to, sh to show you today about Petronas is public information, you can go online and look it up. I'm just putting it into context for you, right? Um, Petrona is really a major player in um, deep water Mexico. And we enter um, uh, in, in 2017, 2018, uh, we start having an office here. Uh, you can see here that, um, let me put on the laser pointer here that um, we have, let me put on my timer here so I know where I am. When we enter Mexico, we enter it in the big way. You know, most people come in just Salina Basin where everything is more obvious that you have a lot more data, it's salt basin, right? But when, when Petrona enter, um, we enter in two, three different basins from Perdido uh, area up to the north here, uh, which is, you know, there's a try on discovery up here, very close to the border to, to US, uh, down to um, uh, Mexican riches. We have three blocks. The green are what we have uh, as a company here in, in Mexico, Mexico. And then we have six blocks in, in, in Salina Basin. 
all of these greens. Um, and five of these blocks, the one in red, those are the operated blocks. So we do drilling with, uh, uh, we are dealing with eight different partners. Um, you know, we have probably, uh, other than Shell, we have the most acreage uh, of the foreign company in Mexico. We put a lot of money in the investment. And currently we have about, about 100 people. And in GNG, we have about a uh, total of about 20, 25 people. So like I said, we entered in 2018 and then we start drilling uh, in 2019 um, with, and so far we have drilled 10 wells since I joined the company. And those are 10 wells in deep water. You can imagine that's quite a lot of work. Uh, we have technical success in Salina Basin is 50% and commercial success is 33%. So uh, we have uh, three discoveries, two of them are commercial. The discoveries are Cholula, Kinwal, and Pollock. So that kind of gives you a context, right? Um, oh, I forgot. So in, in my current role as a senior technical manager for uh, Salina Basin, when I joined Petronas, I was informed that I'm going to uh, be in charge of technical program uh, in Salina Basin, uh, basically a chief geoscientist for Salina Basin. And, um, you know, from uh, project planning, uh, quality assurance, uh, prospect identification, maturation, and to drilling. So I'm working with a lot of different teams. But when I came here, uh, we did not have anyone to look after Perdido and um, Mexican Ridges. So from 2019 to 2021, I was also uh, in charge of all the three areas. So it's quite a lot of uh, uh, area to cover with uh, different geographic areas. So just a little bit more about Petronas here. Um, so like I mentioned before, we came in big and we want Mexico to be a new heartland for Petronas in Mexico, right? Um, like I say that we drew about 10 wells. Um, now, all of the wells that we drew outside the Lina Basin, unfortunately, those are the area where we know that it has high risk uh, you know, so we drilled Sackpoon well, it was a dry hole, and then we drilled two wells in Mexican reaches. Uh, that also dry hole, but we learn a lot from this basin and we continue to explore to find more a new concept. But our focus area is Salina Basin. We know from the get go that those going to be the focus area, and that's proven by all the discovery that we had. Um, and actually, Pollock and Kinwal Discovery, which are located in Block 3 and I, we are partnered with Repsol. Uh, those going to be um, uh, SID in 2024 and then uh, first oil in 2026. Now, my role here is um, now we have identified um, the, uh, that we have pinpoint that this is we're going to focus in Salina Basin. So uh, I have uplifted the area and uh, defined sweet spots and sediment fairway and all that work has been done. So we now, uh, within the block area here, we even more uh, have more focused area uh, for, the, uh, for the future because we only have limited manpower and we cannot do everything, right? So just a little bit of benchmark how we are doing um, in, in Mexico, right? So this is the industry uh, information from all of different sources that we have here. And I put together that, um, you know, from uh, in offshore deep water, technical discovery, uh, you know, is about uh, 30, 34% for deep water. And, um, you know, discovery that more than 50 million barrel of oil recovery uh, is about uh, 15%. Um, and we have, you know, the dry hole is about 55%. Uh, 
And a lot of the wells that they drill in Carroll and deep water, uh, you know, these are the number of wells, 45 wells in 43 wells so far in uh, shallow water versus uh, 33 wells in deep water. So all in all of this, this statistic, right? So in Salina Basin, uh, the ratio between uh, exploration well and discovery well is, you know, we drill about 16 well and discovery by about 10 wells in Salina Basin. Now we do not have success in, um, we mean industry do not have success in Mexican Ridge and you know some success in Perdido. So how do Petronas uh, compare with with the industry, right? So technical technically we are 50 percent uh, technical success in Salina Basin, and commercial success is 33 uh, percent. So we are in line with the industry, but of course our my boss was saying that that's not good enough. So we are striving to do better, and we hope to do so uh, in uh, in the future. Uh, as we have uh, this year alone, we have two more wells to drill uh, in deep water in my area. And then uh, early next year, they will drill another well uh, in, in Salina Basin here. So we hope for uh, more success. So that is about Petuna, right? So let me uh, tell you how do I get here. Um, I'm, I'm a, th a native of Thailand, uh, but I live in the U.S. for a long time. Uh, I got my bachelor degree in geology from uh, university in Thailand, and my master degree is from South Dakota School of Mines in uh, geological engineering. So I started my career uh, when I graduated with my ba uh, bachelor degree in for the electricity company, and at that time we were drilling for geothermal when geothermal was not cool yet. So that's when I started my career. And then I came for my master degree. Uh, and then I started my first job um, at, at Amoco. And then I moved on to ENI, uh, Statoil, Noble Energy, uh, Cantium, and here I am at Petronas in 2019. Um, just a little bit of uh, a side story that when I was um, when I was when I was studying my for my master degree in uh, South Dakota School of Mines, uh, after I finished in 1988, um, I wasn't sure what I want to do in my life. I think this seems to be a uh, recurring problem with me that I'm not. I don't have a clear vision uh, of what I want to do. And I think this is part of the problem in, in our career. You know, I think for people that are very successful, they have a very clear vision of what they want to do in my life. And actually, I'm actually not really one of them like it's, <laughs> in, in that respect. So after I got my master's degree, uh, I um, after, after I got a master degree, I uh, decided that okay, maybe I would like to um, to to continue with my uh, PhD. So I went on to study a PhD. You can come on this side. Um, uh, went on to study for my PhD for a year and a half, um, and then I decided that well, I don't really know what what I want to do with my dissertation. So I was just kind of fumbling around, not knowing what I want to do. So one day my professor, my thesis, my dissertation professor called me into his office and said that, hey, Anglia, uh, there will be a company that come interview uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for a geophysicist. Why don't you go and uh, interview? You know, I, I actually, I was pretty crushed when my professor told me that uh, maybe you should get a job, you know. So he kind of made a decision for me. So I gradually uh, put my uh, resume together, went on and get a suit, and then just walk in into interview, just kind of like, okay, whatever, you know, you want me to go interview, I go to an interview. So I, I went to interview uh, and on my campus with um, this gentleman from Amoco. And, and then he asked me, you know, um, well, 
would you like to come for a plant visit in Houston? And I said, well, sh oh, sure, you know. So I went in and for a plant visit. And then the next day uh, he called me and he asked me, uh, and he offered me a job, you know. So, <laughs> so I, I, I was kind of stumbled into getting a job without really um, uh, thinking that I would get it, right? So I quit my PhD uh, program and then came to Houston and, and, um, and then start working for Amoco in 1989. And luckily that Amoco has a very good training program and I was able to uh, start working after a year, you know, and was working in Egypt operation. So I had a good opportunity to work uh, at at Amoco in Egypt operation, and then move on to um, uh, subsalt shelf team. Now, the good thing about working Egypt uh, operation is that I have opportunity to travel there, which is part of my career goal is to travel. And also, at the beginning of the uh, PSDM um, technology, so I was able to be able to, you know, um, be testing uh, different PSDM algorithm uh, when they uh, working with seismic processor. And after eight years at Amoco, uh, I decided that, you know, enough is enough with a lot of layoff. Uh, and even though I was not selected to be part of the layoff, it kind of get to me that, you know, it, you have to be in a stressful situation every year. So I decided to move on to ENI, and when I move on to ENI, ENI has just started uh, working in deep water and I want someone with uh, subsoil and, and deep water experience. Uh, at that time, I did not have deep water experience. You know, I only have subsoil experience, and I was doubting myself if they would even select me because you know, uh, I don't have every 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 qualification that. Uh, people uh, the company asked for. And my husband was like, you know, nobody even can have all their um, qualification. Nobody fit the profile. If you have 70%, I think you can apply. So I apply and work at ENI and I end up at ENI for 14 years. And I think that was one of the best uh, company to work for uh, at ENI. Uh, there's a lot of chaos, a lot of different things, you know, and actually, um, different culture that experience that I had, right? And then after ENI, uh, I was working in deep water exploration and um, made some discoveries uh, that I can talk about it later, some several discovery at ENI. Um, then I, I decided that uh, I would like to move on to, um, to do field development. So when that oil, uh, that when that oil offered me uh, a position in field development project uh, at that oil. Right. So um, then I moved to Norway and spent a couple years in Norway. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I I worked in that oil in Houston. Yeah. I spent two years with uh, in Norway with E and I. I got confused here. <laughs> sorry about that. And then um, after working in field development. Uh, in that oil for, for a while, um, I decided that, you know, that oil at the time in exploration program did not have many success and my project is running out uh, in terms of field development project. I was, um, you know, do, working on veto field development project with Cheryl. So I decided that, okay, it's time for me to uh, move on. And that's when I went to Noble Energy uh, and from 2014 and 2018, uh, working in um, as a, pro, a team lead, successive lead for uh, Gabon and Congo team. Um, that that was when I uh, spent a lot of time uh, there. Sorry. So um, after um, the time at Noble, uh, I was laid off. Uh, at Noble, and I kind of come back to that later. And it took me some time to find a, a job, with, uh, you know, but I finally found a job um, in late 2018 
at a, com a small company uh, in Louisiana called Cantian. But that wasn't really the real um, goal in my career because I, I like work international and that is more of my passion. You know, always try to go international. Uh, so that was when I formed a strategy and uh, get a job, uh, found a, a job that I really want to do, which is where I am now at Kitana. Okay. Um, now, I'm just going to go briefly, um, you know, in uh, about the area that I have worked uh, before I go into the personal part. So these are not chronologically in terms of company, because some of the companies I work, uh, you know, is a mixed area. I'm just going by geographic area. I do advance here. So these are all the areas that I have worked. Uh, so let's start with, with the first one is in Thailand. So um, I was working in the geothermal project. It was the first geothermal project in the northern part of Thailand, right? So it, it was at Fang Geothermal Project in the very northern part of Thailand. Uh, and the project was run by the Electric City Generation Authority of Thailand. Um, so we basically, you know, drill for geothermal water. And uh, right now it is a small, um, this particular plant is just a small uh, capacity, 0.3 megawatt, uh, you know, pretty hot water here. And it's used for local uh, drying, agricultural crop, crops and hot water therapy. So it was really a great time for me because actually doing a lot of field work in that area, uh, resistivity survey, stuff like that, and, and then got to do, uh, have experience real hand on, on drilling well, right? And then the next uh, area that I was working for five years is uh, the Gulf of Suez in Egypt um, and also, also offshore Mediterranean and Western uh, Desert. So I was working uh, on regional mapping, prospect generation, bit brown. Uh, so that was also a fun time in, in Egypt. And actually I have some uh, interesting story uh, about working in uh, Egypt for an American company you know, at Amoco at that time. And Amoco is now uh, of course BP, right? So being a woman, and at that time, it was quite challenging because I was, um, you know, traveling there. Now I was working very well with the Egyptian counterparts. However, the problem that I had was on the American side, our counterpart, because um, I, um, when I travel there, I usually, uh, do not get opportunity to present my own work, you know, and my partner usually take over and present it, you know, and, and I think that was part of the early generation, uh, late, I mean, early at that time that, okay, I only have a few year experience here, so the project lead always presenting, right? However, when we engage with the authority, um, and there was one time that I was, um, at that time we were using paper <laughs> seismic line and GAPCO, uh, who was a partner uh, for the project, you know, uh, they have a lot of data uh, in, uh, over in Cairo office. And we need some of those data to transport it like physically back to Houston to work. So my team lead, project lead, went and asked the GAPCO manager for the data. And I think the way he approached it was mm, probably very Texan way, um, uh, very strong. And the manager there was like, no, we don't have it. We couldn't find it, whatever, you know? So he came back and said, no, we couldn't get it, right? 
So the next day I happened to meet the Gapco manager and then he invited me and like, hey, you want to have some tea, you know? So we have some tea together and we chit chat about family. And then I asked, you know, that data, um, could you, you know, let us have it? And Elsa was, of course, yeah, we can, we can have it sent over to you, to, you know, to your office, no problem at all. So I came back and I was so excited, you know, I, I told my team lead that, hey, we got the data. And, you know, of course, I totally pissed him off that you know, they, they gave the data to, to me. But I think sometimes i using different approach and, and being a woman, I mean, that I think that could be to our advantage, right? Um, I spent about 18 years in um, the U.S. Gulf of Mexico and, um, you know, working in subsoil, uh, again, I, I realized that um, that would be the niche that I take on early in my career that I would like to work in the subsoil exploration and that I always stick with it. So um, when I was working uh, in, uh, at, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico at e and I, uh, I was part of the team with UNOCAL that we made a discovery, uh, first ever real cost discovery in very deep water at a prospect called Trident. Now, because of the location of it, it this is to the east and east of Great White, uh, it's very difficult to make it economic. I think it's still stranded uh, to this day. Um, I also make uh, an, a part of the team that actually identify and work uh, and drill uh, two prospects and now call Appaloosa and Longhorn oil and gas field uh, with recoverable, uh, recoverable uh, resource of over 200 million. And it's still, um, part of the ENI uh, portfolio at the moment. And, um, you know, work on field development uh, in many areas, including um, the veto field, uh, participate in, in, in the drilling of all the appraisal at veto. Um, while I was at e &I, I went to Norway, and this is how I met a lot of wonderful uh, women over there um, that we still friends to this year. And I spent two years in Norway working in offshore mid-Norway and uh, Barents Sea, and also working on evaluate a few called, uh, a, a discovery called Victoria, a gas, gas discovery. I think, being in Norway, I think people think that it is a very modern, um, you know, modern country. But I found that it in the first year it was quite difficult to to be um, in Norway, and part of it is the culture because um, in my experience, um, the Norwegians are very smart, very nice people. However, it took a long time to warm up to become friends. And um, it took me over about a year, right? I have a two year contract there. And it took me about a year to get to know people, you know? So there are on weekend, you have to be self um, uh, sufficient, you know, with your family and do your own stuff because you're not ha you don't have a lot of friends to hang out with. So not until after one year that um, I'm open to uh, people are, starting invite me to their home. And, you know, I, I met this wonderful group of uh, female uh, geoscientists and we hang out, um, you know, once a year at Quitsoy cabin. I mean, that's a wonderful experience and memory that I have uh, with all those uh, dear friends. But it takes a while. Now, another interesting thing that uh, I discover in Norway is that while I was working uh, as an Italian company um, in Norway, Norway, the culture kind of crashed, right? So the, the Norwegian has different way of working and, and, and communicating, and the uh, Italian have totally different way of communicating as well. So 
that kind of class at some time because you know the Italian would be uh, going to the coffee room and then talk about this about that and then they would you know at the end they will ask you for information uh, you know work related whereas the Norwegian would come directly to your office and, and don't even say hello sometime and say angry I want this you know and the first time it was like whoa you know this is rude but that's the way people are and there's just some difference right so that's what you have to 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 factor into your work in west africa i spent um you know a few uh only about four years working there uh, in kingston at noble office so that was uh, also a wonderful experience uh, uh working in gabon and partly in congo so what happened after 28 years of working um, in the oil industry, I'm just coasting basically, I'm using the word coasting because, you know, when something go wrong um, or um, I don't like something in the current company, I look for something else, you know, and it just basically uh, have the opportunity looking for, uh, but I, I didn't look for specific things, you know, I'm just kind of coasting to the next company. You know, luckily that I'm doing pretty well for 28 years, right? But when Novo decided to uh, let me go in 2018, I was totally unprepared. You know, I don't really network. I was too busy working. You know, I, I, I don't network. And when I heard the news, actually, I was stunned. I remember I was driving home and I said, no, I couldn't be home at this time. Uh, I don't know how to tell my family that I just got back, you know. So I stopped at, at the park uh, near my uh, house, Kikarilo Mitchell Park. I think people at work at Noble know where it is. And I just sat there and I'm like, what just happened, right? So I wasn't sure that I heard it right. So I called my friend, a big friend that, hey, I just got laid off. Are you doing okay? And some of them said yes, some said no, I got it too. So that kind of woke me up. And I was still feeling okay because I, I realized, I, I think that I thought that maybe next week I would find a job, right? Because once the headhunter know that I got laid off, I got, I start getting a lot of phone calls. So I felt pretty comfortable. Yeah, yeah, I'll get a job, you know. And then um, I started interview the following week with two companies. And I think at that time, I didn't have a clear picture of what I want in my life. I didn't do well in the interview, you know. I, I have quali technical qualification, but I wasn't ready for an interview. I think that would be... <laughs> Uh, advice for people after you get laid off you have to kind of sort it out a little bit before you go for an interview because it will show you know so I spent about six months uh, looking for jobs uh, start networking like crazy call everybody that want to have lunch or coffee with me you know I being a nuisance to everyone uh, go to different uh, meeting, training, anything, right? And I got quite a lot of interview. However, I always come in second. And by the time I got an interview, um, the job was already, you know, uh, some, they already had someone in mind, a buddy or some, someone that they already have in mind. So it wasn't working for me that I, um, I, all, I, I start getting really um, discouraged that, you know, six months, six or seven interviews, nothing, no offer. And I had a career coach, her name is Dan Kritzler, and from the, uh, the package that Noble kindly gave me. Um, and they were talking about uh, strategy. What is your strength? You know, how do you define your strength, right? And and then, um, so I came up with this page of what is my career, uh, one page of the summary of my objective, you know, and position statement. Position statement is it's 
it's a summary of what you are, you know, and then the com uh, the strength of your competence, right? So I came up with this, and then I, I went further, you know, this may sound very uh, arrogant, but I said, you know, heck with all these companies that didn't hire me, you know, that's their loss. So I'm gonna come up with the metrics for, for myself. And this is what I came up with uh, on my own, that, um, that who, am, who do I want to work for? So I look for the type of work, the company focus, financial aspect, the career path, woman friendly, geography, and I come up with a scorecard. And then I went on and researched with all the company in the world. I don't care where they are geographically because I talked to my family and said, hey, if I get a job in West Africa, would you go with me? And my husband said, no problem. You know, we'll make it work. So that's a nice thing about having a supportive spouse. So I came up with this metric and there's two company in the world <laughs> that uh, at that time that I want to work for. You know, I mean, thing changed, right? At that time, that was I want to work for. So um, I, and the, one, the comp one first company that I target was PTTEP, which is a Petroleum Authority of Thailand. And the second company is Petrona. So, um, and, and, and the main reason I want to work for an NOC company, because I think those are the companies that are going to have money to do exploration, and they are international companies, and both companies are Asian, and I feel like I can use my being Asian uh, to, to, to my um, benefit, you know, advantage, once and for all, you know, I couldn't compete with the good old boy in the U.S., so I might as well use of my, uh, my uniqueness, right? So I call uh, a bunch of people I know in Thailand and I was able to get through and put the resume in front of the uh, expiration VP of PTTEP. So I set a meeting with him and he didn't know me and, you know, and ex I explained to him what I'm looking for, what position, kind of like advisor position that what I can offer to uh, uh, for PTTEP. And all he worried was, uh, you are a Thai and we can't hire you as an expat. That was his comment. And I was thinking that, you know, with a person that have limited version of, you know, let's walk, let's not worry about the salary. Let's, let's, Let's think about what I can offer you with, you know, as a national and as of all this international experience, then we can worry about the value later, but he could not go beyond that. So I quit. I just like, thank you very much. I move on, which leads me to only one company that I want to work for. So I, again, I did contact uh, people that I know and I asked him personally to hand deliver my resume to uh, chief geoscientist in Petronas, and he did, you know. And then I haven't heard anything from that from Petronas for two for a month. So I start my campaign. I said, how do I get someone to notice me? You know, my resume. You know, I might have a wonderful resume, but if nobody read it, you know, what good is it, right? So I contact other people that I know uh, of someone who know, at know at Petuna, and then I also send resumes uh, to them, right? So, um, and then I realized that the VP of exploration of Petuna, who is a woman, is coming to Houston for Global Women Network uh, Energy Conference every year. So I, at the time, I don't have a lot of money. I mean, I was running low on money. So I, I called the organizer of Women Network, uh, uh, the Global Energy, right? I said, uh, can I volunteer, you know, for, for in place of attending? And she said, sure. So I went in and stopped envelope and, and doing all kinds of work to attend the free seminar. And I got in. And I saw the Petrona entourage, but Petrona usually go everywhere with 
you know, a bunch of people. And how do I <laughs> go in and introduce myself? You know, it's kind of awkward to just walk in, hi, you know, here's my resume. So I walk in into a different room and they have a networking session and, um, you know, during a break. And then I actually walk in and I happen to step into the, by luck, happen to step into uh, the same table as someone that came from Petrona, Mexico. So I talked to her and I asked her that, you know, I'm looking for a job. I'm just very frank. Can you introduce me to your vice president? And she was very kind. And, and you know, you asked her and she introduced me to. And I talked to Emilena, um, uh, Emiliana uh, Rice Oxley, who's the vice president at the time. She's now retired. Um, and I have five minutes. I hand her my business card. I said, here's my business card. And this is what I do. If you're interested, call me. And I just walk away, you know, five minutes. And um, I haven't heard from her for two weeks. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, she texted me and said, oh, I read your resume, Andrea. You actually, um, you know, we already have in the system. And someone from HR will contact you and arrange for interview. So I guess my point is, you know, you have to be creative uh, in what you want. And, um, I mean, in, in how to get what you want. So I, I went to many, many different people uh, and I met Emelina and, um, you know, and people uh, in Petsona, several of them have my resume. So I'm pretty sure that when someone mentioned my name, um, someone might say, oh yeah, I, I, I heard of her before, you know. So it's kind of like a dripping uh, marketing, uh, water is dripping from a uh, different direction. So, so I, I got a job offer and here I am working in Petsona uh, since 2019, right. Um, I think to sum up uh, my challenge um, before I go to the last slide is that a lot of time in for myself, you know, I I'm struggle every day because I have a I live in the U.S. for over 30 years, but I'm still considered my, I'm still Asian, and sometimes the way I speak, uh, soft, it appears to be more like a lack of confidence. And I have to admit that early on in my career, I I did not have camp confidence in saying anything in the meeting room, you know, and my problem also <laughs> is that. Sometimes I don't promote myself enough. And, and early on in my career, I let someone else present my work, you know, which is commonly, um, I've seen a lot in women. Uh, I also tend to apologize. And sometimes, you know, I don't really know my value. You know, now I think I do, but um, <laughs> we'll see, right? And I have a hard time figuring out what I really want in my life, you know, personally or professionally. Not until someone actually kicked me in the butt and like, you know, noble energy kicked me in the butt and I just woke up and said, like, wait a minute, what do I really want to do? And sometimes it needs a kind of uh, a strong event to, to push you to think. And I'm struggle, uh, just like many people. I, I don't like conflict, you know, and try to avoid it. Um, sometimes it's, it's, it's not a good thing, you know. And I just want to sh also share with you that as a mother of two, um, I mean, one of them is adult, one of them is semi-adult, um, is that I always have this guilt about having to take care of the family, you know. Um, so I'm just like the rest of you, you know, you have think about what do I do with the family? Uh, and I think I could have gone a little further if I choose to, uh, to, to um, not feel, feeling guilty to so much, you know. And the last thing is that I don't network, I did not network enough before the layoff. Uh, I think now I do. Uh, I try to be, uh, you know. So how do I network, right? I go to a lot of industry professional um, and organization meetings. 
I t when I was an unemployed, I take free classes, you know, or reduce price. Uh, I attend uh, a lot of women related conference. Um, I go to U of S, I go to Rice University, just attending different uh, presentation, you know, interact with faculty, students, you know, just trying to keep myself sharp on, uh, on the technology. I constantly uh, go out now <laughs> with friends or, you know, have coffee, lunch, and networking all the time. Um, because most of the time, 85% of the jobs are about to networking, right? I do a lot of volunteer. Uh, here, um, I volunteer with the local community uh, um, every two weeks. I help our uh, foundation uh, in Mexico City, and we uh, help serve and cook and serve uh, elderly uh, at the church in Santa Fe in Mexico City. Um, you know, you work a lot on LinkedIn, um, and then you keep building network after you found a job, right? So oftentimes, you know, difficult roads, um, it could lead you to a beautiful destination, you know? Uh, I think you just have to, uh, to work at it. So um, with that, I'm open for questions. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Inglia. Um, it's funny. Uh, I I had no idea your background in the in geothermal in Thailand, and um, <laughs> I feel like we we should have we should have chatted a lot about that when we were working together. Um, I worked. At, I did a SEG geoscientist without borders in Chiang Mai, and we uh, did some geothermal assessment up up near there too. So um, wow. something else to chat about. See, we're networking already. Um, I, there's been a couple questions that have come in. Um, well, first, uh, Henry Pattingill says that it's great to hear both of us. Um, good to good to have you on, Henry. I appreciate that. Um, and I have another question um, from Dennis. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your career path. Um, how are you able to overcome these challenges? Uh, it seems like there's a lot of people who share your similar um, similar challenges. Um, is there a way that we can, you know, overcome those? Uh, you know, how do we uh, how do we start to be a little less humble about our work, um, or you know, uh, increase you know that that build that confidence in ourselves. So the, the question is, how do you be uh, promote uh, your work? Or... Yeah, um, okay. you know, how how to overcome your um, the challenges that you that you've been facing? And I just you know I threw out a couple uh -huh. examples there. Right, right. Um, I think it's it's all individual cases, right? And I think you have to be brave. You have to be courage. Uh, you have to know what you want, and you just have to go for it. Uh, come up with the the way to to overcome that. I mean, the first step. Um, I think one of the example. I think this this is coming advice coming from uh, Susan Cunningham. Actually, she was my boss in Egypt operation uh, before Noble. You know, I I had lunch with her one time, and then she realized how difficult uh, it is for me to to say, you know, to say something in the meeting or to express myself. And she said, Anglia, you know, you just have to open your mouth, say it, you know, it will be difficult the first time that you do it because sometimes you, you don't know if your answer is right, but other people, they don't know the answer either, especially with men, you know, they would come up with answer that a lot of times you know more than you do, they do. So just open your mouth and say it. And the more you do it, the more you will become confident at, at overcome that fear. And I think I took her advice and that was very kind advice. And you just have to, to go for it, you know, and then it will build more confidence of doing it. Yeah. That Great. would be my suggestion. Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a good suggestion. Um, I see that there are a couple hands raised, and unfortunately, in this like the webinar format, I can't let you speak. So, if you have specific questions, can you put those um, in the Q and A? Um, thank you. 
Um, let's see. Another question just came in also from Henry. What are your most, what are you most proud of in your career, Anglia? Henry, that's, that is a difficult one. <laughs> um, what would be my most proud of, right? Uh, I think I, I have each of the career that I have. I mean, if, if the, the company that I have, I have a moment of proud in each of them, right? They're all different. Some of them could be technical. Some of them could be personal, you know, uh, and, and, and all this stuff. I think the most easiest one is, is, is the current one that I have, you know, and, and I feel really um, honored that I'm able to use everything I learned in my 30 years before Petronas and then actually apply uh, here, you know, something that worked in the past, something that didn't work in the past and able to work in the culture uh, here. I think that that is very, very important to me. Um, you know, here we have uh, staff of various different nationalities that I work with globally, uh, uh, remotely. Uh, we have quite a lot of consultants here uh, in pretty much every continent that we work with, I work with, and able to bring them uh, together uh, ideally and integrate that work uh, into the, the local people, uh, our uh, Mexican staff, you know, to, to, to work together, and also the Malaysian staff, you know, all through different culture and come up with a, a, a very integrated team, you know, teamwork to, to do it together. I think that would be my current proudest moment that um, able to work across the culture and, and bring ideas together. Thanks, thanks for that question, Henry, and um, hope to see you at SEG. Um, thanks. Uh, let's see, I have another question from Adriana. Um, how have you changed your view of you, that you don't know your value after 33 years of experience? So have you done anything to realize that yes, you have enormous value? How do you overcome that? Um, I think just putting what I know, uh, what my experience in a single page, page of paper that I, I show you uh, my marketing tool, um, I think that that loss of job and having to find another job, you know, in a in a reasonable time frame, you know, and having to put everything in one um, page, I think that helped me a lot to to crystallize uh, and know my value. You know, when I start putting things that I know in the paper, it kind of becomes. Um, I'm not boasting, but oh, I, I do know that stuff, you know, kind of thing, that thing. I, I didn't know that I know those stuff until I actually write it down. So that would be, uh, you know, that, that's how my thought is, thought process. Great. Um, let's see, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, Let's see. Oh, um, I guess there's some a couple of people who would like to catch up with you after this meeting. Um, sure. So, um, but uh, there's one more question. Um, and so um, it was actually specific to uh, your group um, that you worked with at ENI. Um, you alluded to um, just now um, with Petronas, uh, you know, kind of cross cultural relationships, bringing together Malaysia and Mexico. Um, was your group at ENI also multicultural? Um, I know you mentioned the Italians and Norwegians kind of approach things differently, um, but were you kind of the only, you? were like the only what what how you would say outlier um I suppose or were there other um were there other additional you know additional cultures that you had to uh had to work with mm -hmm. no uh there were uh, other uh, uh you know culture at ENI of course you know both here in Houston and also uh you know over in Norway um 
so you know I, I deal with different uh, culture all the time so and I think having a background uh, with traveling since I was 15 years old uh, I start traveling uh, on my own and uh, to various different countries I think that kind of uh, make me not really afraid of different culture and also try to look into um, you know from a different point of view of, of from their shoes, you know, what would this culture think of me or how do I think of other people? So no, I mean, it, 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 it's all multicultural at ELI, yes. Okay, great. Um, I think, unfortunately, that's all the time we have um, for uh, for today, but thank you so much, Anglia, um, for uh, presenting your journey. Um, we, I think you, you know, you're a fantastic role model and I'm glad we were able to do this. Um, for everyone else on the call, um, I we are uh, we have a presentation um, for next September for September's webinar is actually going to be hosted by uh, co-hosted by Adriana Sola and Kristen Walker um, on resilience in their in careers and um, essential for pivoting. Um, so please join us for that one. Uh, you can register on the SEG website. Um, so thank you again for, uh, for joining us today. And thank you again, Anglia, for presenting um, and sharing your journey. Um, and uh, until September, uh, we'll see you then. Thanks. Thank you very much and goodbye.